And we are live. Welcome to another episode of the New York Information Security Meetup. And I have the great pleasure to introduce Greg Scanthi, who's the Chief Technical Officer for Blue Shift uh, Cyber. How are you, Greg? You know, it's it's cold, but I'm good. <laughs> you know, I love your background, and it's not virtual. Uh, you travel a lot around the country, and, uh, you know, I absolutely love it. And uh, you also have unbelievable background. You've uh, you've done so much in your career. So why don't we start uh, to set the stage in terms of who you are, sure. how you got into cybersecurity, and uh, you know, advancing your career, and and got to even train uh, you know folks in NASA, which is unbelievable. Um, so yeah, I, I have a storied career, and I, it just happens to be I'm old. That's why you know I <laughs> I, I have a, I have stuff. So. You know, I started, I have a degree in electrical engineering from Purdue. I, I, I focus more in, on the networking side. So, you know, basically, you know, learning networking from the chip level up and that kind of stuff. But uh, I've always been very interested in, you know, network communications and that kind of stuff. And that led me to get a job as um, a network and security engineer at a steel, steel mill. Um, actually, not too far from where I'm at. It was um, a place called Bethlehem Steel. Um, but it, it gave me a lot of... Um, experience in dealing with very high stress, you know, uh, uh, production critical, mission critical items. And they sent me to school for everything. I got taught Ethernet by like the guy who invented Ethernet and all this stuff. So, um, but I have a problem with authority, right? So I, I couldn't work for someone for very long. So I had to get out and start my own business. And I, so I started a business doing, um, we were an MSP company, but I did the security part for that. So I started off really, really kind of doing, uh, we wouldn't even really call them pen tests back then, but just looking at, at operations at, at, for our customers and securing the best we could back in the 90s, right? So they didn't really even call it cybersecurity back then. And that just kind of progressed. I ended up leaving that MSP. I started a company that did just uh, offensive cyber. So um, I did uh, you know, red teaming, adversary emulation, you know, that kind of stuff, pen testing, risk management frameworks, those sorts of things. Um, but I always had this... this um, a background in ICS and OT, so in, in um, industrial control systems and operational technology. Um, even though my business life, I did mostly business IT. But um, I had a friend um, about five or six years ago, as I was doing this uh, red teaming, um, who also taught at NASA, and she's like, "Hey, I think they would really they would enjoy a class from you." And so um, I talked to them. Told them what I did, told them what I could teach, you know, that kind of stuff. And they've had me back several times. I, I, prior to COVID, I was going probably once or twice a year. Um, and hopefully that'll pick up again, too. But it's, you know, teaching is one of the great things you get to do. And it teaches you a lot, too, right? So um, going to teach, it's a lot of uh, research. So for me, every hour of class is about eight hours of research um, just to make sure things are right and they're current. Um, and I've done those type of classes for not just NASA, but like law, law enforcement for the Internal Revenue Service for all kinds of stuff. Um, but it really kind of keeps you on your toes. And fast forward, you know, um, Sigent was an, another company I was involved with. I was a founder. I'm still a, a founder there, um, even though I'm part of Blue Shift now. Um, and we started that company. Uh, it, it, they acquired my cybersecurity company and the things we had. Um, but doing this stuff and, and going through the red team stuff really kind of put me on the path of um, I was upset. <laughs> I was going to customers and, and doing, uh, you know, even, you know, this vulnerability analysis or just simple uh, penetration test. And the amount of detection and response that they had was, was just bad. <laughs> you know, we were doing things that were atrocious on the networks and they're having a really hard time uh, detecting is, uh, that kind of stuff. And it was because those things weren't affordable to them or they just didn't know. Um, you know, they had their IT teams and we'll probably talk about this later, you know, but uh, um, they expected their IT team to be the guys who were defending the networks. And it's just not a fair fight. So um, that led me to to my, me and my team to start building some defensive technologies for these guys. Um, that was probably five or six years ago. And that has progressed now all the way to the point now we, where we have Blue Shift, we have an XDR platform and, and we are uh, running a SOC for uh, a lot of customers to help them, you know, defend against what's happening today, which is scary. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, listen to you. So you're an educator, you're ah. an entrepreneur, <laughs> and as well as you're a practitioner, which I, I think these all the stars are aligned in terms of what you're doing today. Um, is that a correct statement? That, I, you know, I never thought about it that way. I just like to do things, right? And <laughs> and so, like, it, it, even in my, my bio, I tell people, you know, I'm, a, I'm an eternal noob, right? I, I, I don't have, I, I don't have <laughs> a I, I just, you know... I always want to learn more. I can always learn something from somebody. And I think that 
you know, people in InfoSec have this imposter syndrome a lot of the times, right? They think they should know everything. They, should, they, they think someone's smarter than them. And I just don't give a crap. I don't care if you're smarter than me. Great. Teach me something. Um, let me learn the newest things. Let me, let me figure that kind of stuff out. And I think if you have that that zest for lifelong learning, that cyber is a great career path for you. Um, Cause that's something, I mean, I, I wake up early in the morning. I've been up for a few hours now just researching what's going on because of the things with, you know, Russian and Ukraine and, and the cyber attacks that could spill over from that kind of stuff. Um, it's just, if you have that passion for learning, it's, it's a great thing to do. So I don't really, you know, you put it in a very eloquent way, but uh, I just, I just consider myself a, a guy who likes to learn and likes to tinker. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And humble as well. So no, when do we, um, when do we jump into just uh, your experience in offensive security? Mm -hmm. It's something that it's not always uh, talked about in in positive way because, you know, obviously, you know, not there's no company that really wants to to get uh, you know to get attacked, even even if in a simulation matter. Um, from doing this for several years, what were kind of the top um, major findings that you know that you can like? You know, oh, yeah, I can put it in there. Three. Yep. <laughs> and you hit it right on the head, to be honest with you. I mean, a lot of the companies we dealt with, I mean, they're still clients of ours today when we did red team stuff for. Um, but but I think red teaming or, or penetration testing, if you would bring it down a notch, it gets a bad rap sometimes because of what happened in the early days of pen testing. Right. So in those early days, it was people would go in, we break all the things, um, we give you a report and we go drink beer. Right. And there's none, none of this kind of. What, what happens today and what I think is the right path. And what we did was more of that purple team approach where as you're doing your red team stuff, you're working with their blue team, if they have one or their IT guys, teaching them what you're doing, them showing them what they're not detecting to help build their posture uh, up. Um, but the things we would find almost on every engagement, right? So weak passwords, default credentials, um, and, and exploitable vulnerabilities on the network, right? So these these are things that in in every almost every case we would find those things. And these those are really kind of easy things to for any security practitioner to find. Um, but but what the problem that happens, especially with IT departments, and uh, again I'll probably get into this a little bit later on too. But realize the scope of what IT guys do. It's a lot of stuff, right? So they have to take care of tickets because Jimmy can't print and Billy can't use Outlook and on and on and on, and you know, everybody makes fun of the end user, but we need end users to run our businesses. Um, but that's a that's a that's a big load. They have to you know plan for upgrades and figure out how to migrate into the cloud and what they're doing for this. And then in their spare time, they're expected to defend the network against guys like my team. And our only job is to break in. That's it. That's, I just keep going and going and going. Um, it's not a fair fight, like I said earlier. So we 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 want to show them that there are things you can do. Um, Attackers are lazy, right? So whether they're they're penetration testers or they're a real adversary, they're they're a lazy bunch. They're going to take the shortest path, the easiest path to get to what they want to do. And if you're going to leave those easy things around for them to take advantage of, they're absolutely going to do that. What you need to do is make their job harder, um, not make it easy for them, frustrate them, you know, make it hard for them, increase the cost of the attack so they'll they'll basically go somewhere else. Um, but you know, people that's the, those those three things we would find almost in every engagement. Yeah, and a lot of times uh, some of these engagements go wrong. I, I remember ah. there was a time where, do you remember that time where they were um, the team that was testing these? Uh, I think it was the prosecutor office or something like that somewhere, and then they end up in jail. Yeah, so that's the physical side of things, right? That was okay. something I didn't do. Mm -hmm. um, I, we did not do the the physical. We were we were mo all technical when it comes to that kind of stuff. But yeah, the get out of jail free cards that they have that stuff doesn't work. But things go wrong even even on the technical side. I mean, I, I, in my early in my career, when I worked at the mill, I've, I did major damage, right? I mean, luckily I never got real, real trouble for it, but I mean, I, I broke a lot of things, but you, I tell my team all the time, if we're not breaking stuff, we're not trying hard enough. You gotta, you gotta break some things. You gotta break some eggs to make an omelet. Right. So um, you gotta break things. And it happens even for us. Like when we were doing stuff like that, I mean, I've, I've locked people out of an emergency room. I've shut down, weird clocks for radios for tv stations and done all kinds of craziness um it happens sometimes right but that's part of the contingency planning you do when you do a good red team operation right so or penetration test that you have those contacts you know something's going wrong or they notice something's going wrong you have those those uh, lines of communication open so you can remediate those things quickly it's going to happen better it happens in a controlled environment versus it happening with a real adversary where you're not going to get those operations back quickly um so you know, i still am a big fan of of customers doing a penetration test or, or, or an adversary emulation um, 
exercises, whether even whether tabletop or, or true, you know, full out uh, pen test, it's good for them to do that um, and go through those motions because they'll learn a lot. And even though we don't do it anymore, I, again, we still recommend that our customers do those things. It's good for you. And did you have a the opportunity to have some some tough conversation, tough, um, you know, when you when you go back to the executive and and present those findings and they're not, you know, they're not really that rosy. Did you have a chance to do that? Uh, every time, right? So, and, and you have to be able to do it in a, it's, there's no getting around the fact that cyber is technical, right? And, and the things you're doing are very, very technical in nature. The, the way you're going to, you know, the executives don't care what exploit you used or how you ran a buffer overflow or whatever, all that kind of stuff. Um, they just want to know what to do about it. So you have to be able to put those findings in terms of risk, right? So here's the risk that this has to your company. And that risk can mean anything from the loss of data, lawsuits to losing control of your infrastructure to, you know, being ransomed or, you know, or, or worse, right? So executives tend to understand risk better than they do technicality. So you really need to explain to them, you need to do these things. And yes, it's going to cost money um, and you need to budget that money. And here's why you need to do that. I think if you put in those terms, it's it's better. And then you need to explain things like, you know, like insurance, like people, I have cyber insurance for that. Well, you know, they don't always pay if you don't do things the right way. If you've come in and, and, and you're being negligent in your uh, defensive cyber, then, you know, you're, you, you may have problems getting that paid. So you just have to put in the terms that they understand as business people. And it, that works out well, I think, for, for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, it's not something you, you know, you set and forget it. Like, I mean, you have to do it uh, on a regular basis, right? So that's the thing, right? So you, mm -hmm. you know, you, even the re recommendations, right, that you make and, okay, let's fix these, like the top three things we found, um, you know, the IT environment is so dynamic that, you know, you can do it again within two months and, and yeah. it would be a different, you know, different findings, right? And that's kind of the, that's kind of the tact we took when, when we started Blue Shift. It's this continuous um, this can, you know, continuous monitoring, continuous uh, uh, of fixing things and, and looking for, you know, uh, mistakes or anomalies in the networks and things that could cause risk um, and doing that all, you know, just doing it continuously. And, you know, there's penetration testing is even taken that route a little bit to try to do this, what they call continuous penetration testing. I'm not sure that that works out well. I think, you know, I'm, I'm very old school when it comes to what is a real pen test and real pen test is done by real humans, you know, <laughs> and not automated, you know, it's, it's, you know, hands on keyboards and, and people taking advantage of everything from social all the way to, to, you know, vulnerabilities and things like that. So, um, but you still, I think that, yeah, you're right. You, you people that get in that mentality of doing it once a year or whatever, but it, but it, cybersecurity is going to, and always will be a continuous function. Um, there's no way around it. Things change. They change daily. They change to the minute. I mean, it's just the, the way this is the nature of the beast. And we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so you have to be, we call it quick reaction capability, but you have to have that capability to be able to react to things very, very quickly, make changes for the better, um, or you're going to you're gonna fall victim to one of these these adversaries because there's there's too many of them out there for us to deal with. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and as I mentioned, the attack surface is almost endless, you know, so you don't have to, you know, it's, uh, it's just a matter of getting the cost up for the adversaries to, to have them move somewhere else. Um, so why does, uh, in your mind, uh, prevention only would, would fail? Why, why is that? So I have this adage and I, I say this a lot because customers do tell us, ask us that, well, I have, you know, I have my firewalls and I have my antivirus. I have all those protective measures in place. Um, I think I'm good. And so you really need to think of it in a, in a math sort of way. And so you'll, you'll hear this from red team or penetration testers all the time. Like as an adversary, I only have to be right once. And you as a defender have to be right 100% of the time. And that's actually, that's true. But when you think about what that statement says, it means that you, if you take that approach, that preventative approach of being, you know, uh, uh, trying to be right 100% of the time, it means you have to be perfect. And you can't be perfect. Nothing is perfect, right? In mathematics, there's no such thing as perfection. So perfection is not attainable. So if you can't be perfect, you you lose. You're, you're already on the losing end of the equation before you even got started, right? So <clears throat> prevention only is is just it's 20 year year 2021 year of the o days right so how are you going to prevent an o day right you're not you you don't know what's vulnerable today you don't know what's coming next and we have zero click attacks happening now we have all these things that have just 
there's no way you're going to be able to deal with yeah. it on a preventive and, uh, side. Supply chain, you know, software vulnerabilities. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. just something. The list is endless. And it's solar hard. winds. How do you yeah. how do you prevent a solar winds? You can't. Right. You know. So you have to take that. You have to take that detect and again. You need. It's it's not an all or nothing thing to me, right? So it's not like oh, I shouldn't have any prevention. That's not true, right? It's it's done. Cyber is best done like an onion in layers, and you need to have layers of prevention, and you need to have layers of detection and response, because um, Having those layers of detection response will take something that could be um, a very bad day and again ransom, right? To something that's just a minor inconvenience. Oh, I need to patch this, or I need to, do, I need to, you know, update, update, or do something. Um, so th- those things, in my mind, again, if you take that preventative only approach, you're taking a losing stance. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so let's jump into um, blue shift cyber and th- what what is kind of the unique approach and and you've. It looks like they've you've created like any other entrepreneurs. You found uh, gaps that you know they weren't currently solved in the marketplace, and you decided to, to go ahead and, and you know jump into the deep end and solve. <laughs> yes. So what what's unique about the, so the company and its approach? The, the, the what's unique about us is is our ability to, to scale back, and that sounds odd, I know, but people who who play in this space and it's a crowded space, we we know that, um, but they really want to go after very large enterprise F five hundreds. Um, people with large budgets already have socks in place. And, you know, I've, I've run small businesses all, for most, all my career. Most of my customers are small businesses, you know, I've, and I have small business for us are like, you know, on average, a hundred employees. We have, but we have some customers that are in the, you know, 30,000 employee range or whatever, but um, these are not, you know, a fortune 500 companies by any stretch of the imagination. They just don't know. They don't know what they don't know. They're at, they're at a huge risk. There's millions and millions of these businesses out there and there's no one taking them by the hand and saying, Hey, I got you. Uh, here's what we can do. Here's how we can protect you. Here's how we can monitor you. And we can do it affordably. That's just the thing. We're not going to break the bank. We're not trying to rape you when it comes to the cost of these things. Um, there are strategies and ways we can do this utilizing you know, combinations of open source technology and our own proprietary stuff um, and getting economies of scale out of our SOC that we can do this affordably for small business. And, yeah. it, and by the way, it's Greg, the scary piece, not to cut you off, but the scary no, piece is the, is the is the backbone of the U.S. economy, what you just described, and they have a unique uh, situation where they're like their business is not IT, you know, some of them not IT. Like, I mean, it just uh, they don't have these the resources uh, to to maintain. You know, they might have a uh, one guy or gal that does like you know five other things, right? Well, and don't don't think for a second the adversaries don't know that too. Right. They understand the fact that, again, like I said, Jimmy can't print, Billy can't use Outlook, that what the, the, the conundrum of the IT people and the MSP. Right. So most of those companies will have an MSP. And again, the, those companies think that their MSP's job is to secure them. But it's, it, again, it just doesn't it's two different disciplines. So we really want to focus on that, that small business aspect. We really want to get them protected. We want we want to show them that enterprise level security is available to you. It's it's affordable and it's effective. Um, and here's and the reasons why that is, right? So um, we, we don't want them to think security is out of reach. And, and you know, it's bad with what's happening today from a uh, economic standpoint with ransomware and all this stuff. But you always got to look at the silver lining and everything. At least those things happening has put cyber in the news and put cyber in the boardroom and put cyber on the advisory councils, right? So people are now starting to realize they need to do something, right? Uh, I need to spend a little money. I need to figure out what I'm doing because if I don't, you know, when CNA got hacked, right, they paid $40 million to get their stuff back. That For CNA, it's a huge company, right? So 40 million, no big deal. There's, you know, the small businesses around here, if they're getting popped for a million dollar ransom, they're probably not going to be in business after that, right? So it's the, the, the it's downfall. All those people involved with that business, um, and we just don't want to see that happen, right? I want to be able to protect those guys. So that that's that's what we're here to do. So how do you del- deliver the kind of the value proposition? I mean, it's all about value, right? How much you pay? And typically it's like a monthly you know, mm-hmm. subscription. And then what do you get out of it? Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of me too's, as you mentioned, the marketplace, right? So in terms of uh, providing the kind of the comprehensive security controls associated with like running a business, um, in, in your mind, what is the absolute value proposition for Blue Shift Cyber? Um, that's tough because I'm not a sales guy. I'm a, I'm a tech <laughs> guy, right? But but I think the, the best the, the thing that works best for us is, is we just show them we show them what we do. Like I have a very short presentation I give them. I, I I basically dive in and just show them the platform and show them what we collect, right? How we do our how we do our thing, and 
that seems to they they get it right they understand they start to understand like hey yeah yes i need something like this and when they see the price again we are very very aggressively priced um it, it's you know it's usually you know less it's usually half or a little bit more more than half of what they've been quoted by other companies and they go okay i can't afford not to do this now right so this makes it makes fiscal sense um along with the risk reduction they get out of the platform so um they all know they have to do something now it's not it's not a matter of there's not a small business owner out there now doesn't there is not does not have cyber on the brain um and so it, it's just a good time it's a good time and it's it, i'm glad because they need it yeah and by the way greg you're doing a great job this <laughs> conversation is completely unscripted so any question i ask uh whether it's uh you know i kind of you you managed to answer quite well so i don't work uh, well with scripts if you had a script in front of me i'd be stumbling <laughs> and falling and no i'm i'm more i'm so I, I can't lie. I ask my wife. I just I wear my my kind of heart on my sleeve. So um, it just makes it easier just to flow like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Do you have any uh, success stories you can share of, of folks that have, have turned on the kind of the, the service and, and uh, you know, found something or? All the or, time. Yeah, okay. Every day. I mean, it's, the, the cool thing, the, the unique thing about our platform and not the United States is unique, unique, but, you know, coming from the offensive side, we we understand the things that cause data breaches. Right. So. And whether that's, you know, again, weak credentials or default credentials being out there, ex externally facing services, right? So servers that are that are flat out on the internet that people just for forget about. And this this happened, we, we had a very large manufacturing company. Um, we put our platform on and immediately those things just stick out like a sore thumb and our soccer, our sock guys are like, what is this machine? You know, they come to find out they had two Apache Tomcat unpatched servers just sitting flat out on the internet. Right. Uh, and they just forgot they, they were being used for testing. They just forgot about them. Right. They're like, oh, we were going to decommission those a year ago. I'm like, that's a, you know, that's a breach waiting to happen right there. Right there. And, you know, they, they basically get that for free. You know, we offer what's called a proof of concept for most, most companies. Um, and we find a lot of stuff. You know, we, we find that these misconfigurations that happen um, because that's, a you know, what people don't realize, you know, we work with a lot of the defense industrial base. Um, I've worked, I still have a security clearance and things like that, but when working with those guys, they, the, the, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna, uh, give me one second here. I'm, I'm going to get this train of thought. I want to make sure I get this right. Um, when, when they put things in, they really need to realize that there's risk involved. They want to talk about insider threat is what I want to get at. I'm sorry. The, the word just flipped my mind for a second. But when you do the research into like what insiders really do, no, the real true insider threats of, of a, you know, a, an authorized insider doing something bad are, are very, very small. Um, what most insider threats are, are what we call accidental insiders. So it's someone who's doing their job, right? An IT guy most of the time. Um, they're, trying to, they're trying to do things. They're trying to figure things out and they make a mistake. They misconfigure something um, and they don't realize it, right? That's probably 90% of, of what those insider threats happen. And then if they don't have a way to, to see that, or monitor that, or, or understand the risk increase they're getting out of that, um, it stays out there and that becomes a, a vector for a data breach. So we really try to, to do those things in our engagement. So look for those things that are misconfigured or high risk um, and get them to do something about it, right? Pull it off, you know, filter it in a different way, patch it, you know, do something about that, move it off to a different DMZ um, or things like that. So, so that way they're, they can harden their infrastructure Again, you said it earlier, and I agree with that fact that you know the, the more you raise the cost of the attacker, the more harder you make your attack surface, they're going to move on to somebody else. And that's what you, that's what you, you're not going to attribute these guys. You're not going to you're really not going to figure out who they are. We're not an attribution company. There are companies out there that do attribution. Um, we just don't want them in our customers' networks. Period. Right. So. Yeah, and the example you just mentioned, it's like you know you know insert company X here. It seems like it just it's so prolific, right? So the idea is that. You know the complexity of associated with running infrastructure is so great, and and people are just just people, right? You turn on some some, you know, server for testing purposes, and you forget all about it. It's got default credentials, and before you know it, somebody else is going is in your network for a while. Um, and uh, which leads me kind of the next question. Um, let's talk a bit about the kind of the dwell, um, you know, the dwell time. And first of all, maybe define that and why is that important and how we can use that to, you know, to our advantage. I can't wait. This is my favorite part. Um, <laughs> so remember when I said earlier that as an attacker, I only have to be right once and you as a defender have to be right every time. So that makes us as that, that means you as a defender need to be perfect. What we need to do is turn that paradigm around on the attacker. So once that initial compromise happens, so once, you know, if you think of things in terms of the cyber kill chain, 
you know, after college that you're going to have this initial compromise piece. So when that happens, um, that adversary needs to have really good trade craft, right? He needs to be really, really quiet. If he trips an IOC, an indicator of compromise that we can monitor, um, we can detect that. We can kick him out of the network. We can find out what his command and control is. We can block his command and control. We can do these things that will frustrate him to make him try to have to re-get that beachhead again and get make that initial compromise. And when you do that enough times, they're just going to go away, right? So now what you want to do is you're going to take, once they've gotten into your network, those tables turn. Now he has to be perfect. The adversary has to be perfect and he can't be perfect, right? So we want to, we want to, we want to use that advantage to, we want to use that time that they get in the network to, to our advantage. So dwell time is that time between that initial compromise that happens in a network and the detection of that compromise. And that it's, it's a long time, right? Unfortunately, um, according to IBM, it's 287 days. That's a huge amount of time, right? Like if you, if you have an adversary in your network for 287 days, um, active adversary you you need to buy new infrastructure but you know it really just comes to the point of you know there's different groups doing different things right there's a group that's doing that initial compromise they're going to sell that access to somebody else who's going to do the you know the ransomware they're going to buy the ransomware as a service you know those sorts of things but that whole time that they're in the network to you you detect them or and usually that detection is a call from the fbi or a ransom note on your screen right that's the detection mechanism they have um that's that's our time to shine that's that's our time to be able to uh, detect and frustrate and do those things. And if you put enough detectable, if you're monitoring enough indicators of compromise in your network, you can detect them relatively quickly. So you can take things from that 287 days and take it down to a minute or an hour or even a day. If you did, if you can detect and respond to things that that quickly, um, things that um, would end up in being a very bad day, as in my business is shut down because I'm ransom turn into a minor inconvenience, right? Oh, I need to patch the server. I need to change this password. Um, I need to do change a configuration or whatever the case may be. But it's not, it's not a huge expense and it's not business ending. It's just a minor, it's a minor inconvenience. So um, that's, that's why dwell time is so important. If you, you can use that time that the adversaries are on your network to your advantage um, to d- detect and respond to that intrusion very, very quickly. Um, and we need to do that. That's what we do. And uh, and part of the kind of the secret sauce is that you provide the kind of the extended prevention uh, detection and response, right? So, what's the difference between that and uh, traditional ADRs? Look, in, get, it matter. Perfect. Well, and that's yeah, that's the XDR is a marketing thing in my mind, yes. right? So it, it really is. Um, but what it comes down to is having extended visibility across everywhere you can get data, right? So cyber is a data problem. Um, defensive cyber to me is a data problem. You need to collect a lot of data. And there's no glory. There's nothing special about collecting data. Um, everybody does it. Everybody does it a certain way. Um, everybody has what they think is special. It's not special. Collect, collect your logs, collect your data, collect all this. Traditional EDR endpoint, right? So EDR endpoint detection and response. It's, it's, a, it's a piece of software, very effective. We, we still work with EDR vendors, but um, it's software that meant to go on, meant to go on to an endpoint. A, a, a workstation, a server, or things like that, and detect things on that endpoint. Very, very effective. Um, but you, there's misses. Excuse me, there's misses there, right? You, what are you doing with the cloud? Are you monitoring your cloud environments? What are you doing with equipment you can't put an EDR agent on? Um, ICS and OT is one of those things, right? So industrial control systems, operational technology, IoT. You're not putting EDR agents on all that equipment. You're not putting EDR agents on your network switches or your printers, and all those things can be used in various ways. Um, during a red team operation to, to do things. So what we do is we want to extend our visibility to everywhere we can. We want to go old school, right? We want to collect packet data where we can collect packet data. I'm a packet junkie. I love Wireshark. I love TCP IP. Um, I should probably have an OSI model tattooed on my chest here. Um, but I, I, packet data is one of those great right. things. That, <laughs> Next time, you know, I want to see you shirtless. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let me work out a little bit. Let me work out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, but packet data is one of those things that, that um, it, again, it's old school, but if you can grab it and, it and it has value, it's not bypassable, right? An adversary can't bypass me sniffing packets on a network. And there's huge telemetry in there. There's great things we can do with that stuff. So we want to do that. We want to collect logs from, we want to collect all the things, right? So log all the things, all the, we, we want to collect. Good question for you, Greg. So a lot of times infrastructure so varies so much, right? So you, mm. you get into a customer and they have, they might have collections of all that data, but they don't do nothing with it, right? Or... Mm. Uh, the environment is so diverse where they they don't know what they don't know they don't know where how to collect it. So how do you help your your customers do that? 
So that's part of our process or part of our onboarding process is we ask for things like infrastructure diagrams. And guess what? Most of them don't have them, right? We get that they're, or they're not up to date. I don't care. Give us something. You know, a lot of the guys in our customers, you know, we've been doing large scale networks for a very, very long time. So we understand how this stuff works. And so what we, what we walk them through the process of tell me what you have. Uh, tell me what you're thinking about getting. Tell me what's in your cloud. Are you using the Kubernetes cluster? Are you using just AWS? You have Azure, you have Azure AD, whatever the case may be. Tell us about that strategy. And we we design the uh, sensor topology and the agent deployment for them. And we actually will help them do it. So it, it, we try to, part of the problem, <clears throat> you're going to get me off on a tangent, but because I'm, I'm, very, I'm very opinionated, but part of the problem with, with current, cybersecurity, defensive cybersecurity solutions is they're complex and they, and, and they take a while and a lot of understanding to install. So it, that's going to get pushed back, not only from management, it's going to get pushed back from, from the IT department too. IT guys are busy, right? They don't want to deal with that crap. So you have to take that barrier to entry. You have to make it as easy as possible for these guys to get your platform in. And, and we really try to do that. We really try to make it simple, try to take any complexity out. We will, we work with them, you know, we, on the phone, on Zoom, on whatever we have to do to help them get it installed. Because um, if if it's too complex, they're they're going to put it off. And the more they put it off, the more risk they have. So that's part of what we do is is design that for them, help them get it in, make make that make that barrier to entry into our platform just you know like a slide. You just slide right in there, and and we're off and running. You know. And at what point can they say, okay, we are getting value off it? How long does that take? Day one. Price? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, especially when, when we when we put in things like we watch packet data. That stuff, you know, we we gather a lot of threat intelligence. We do a lot of stuff with our platform, but that's an immediate risk reduction. Like we can see things right away. Um, and usually that first two weeks of installing our platform, we we already have a, a laundry list of changes that should happen, right? So in, a lot of times that don't even happen during a proof of concept where we again we just see things that are egregious. It just sticks out like a sore thumb. So they immediately get the value out of it because we see things that are happening right now. Now, that's not to say that we don't go into places and sometimes things are relatively quiet. It happens. Um, not everybody has, you know, there's a lot of places that put our platform in. You know, they have good IT practice. They have good change control. They're on top of things, but they want to know that there's someone other than them watching over what happens. And we still find things every once in a while, just maybe not immediately. You know, So um, everybody needs it. And what what does the engagement look like afterwards? Like, let's say they've they've installed it, they've run it. You know, what's what's the relationship like? Do, do so, you an extension for their for their team? We're 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 their security team, right? So okay. we're we're their we're their, we were on SOC, we're on Security Operations Center, um, and it's it's very what I call high touch. So you know, we keep we keep playbooks for you know for different scenarios. We keep run books for every customer. Um, and every customer we have contacts with, so we know what our primary backup contacts are. We know how they prefer to be communicated with. So if they want a phone call, they'll get, they'll get a phone call. They, they want to be, they don't want to be called at three in the morning unless it's emergency. Great. We know all that stuff, but our SOC is very proactive at reaching out. And I think that's the big difference. We don't want people telling us, because if you're telling us that you have an issue, then we're not doing our jobs, right? So we are the guys who are reaching out and saying, Hey, we see this. And it, here's what it is, and here's how we would recommend you would remediate that. Um, and again, that hand holding piece of it, uh, you know, white glove service, whatever you want to call it. But um, we just want to be there to be that helping hand and give advice on how to make your environment more secure. And then the cool thing is, you can start to telemetry, get that telemetry from enough customers. We have you know a couple hundred customers out there. You can start to see commonalities. Oh, we found this unique thing at this customer. We know. The other customer has a similar environment. Let's go check it. Let's go hunt over there for that now. And then, oh, look, they got it too. You know, so um, you do get those economies of scales uh, and things like that across customers. Yeah, so. and what you just mentioned is is key. You know, that value add of, of the fact that you are dealing with, you know, all those issues across the board. So you've seen you've seen it many many times, and you have the ability to even see trends before they happen. Like oh yeah. Before before because you already seen it one customer, you're gonna go out and check. Okay. Where are we with all the other, you know, hundred customers, right? So you have that ability to do so, which is again, it's a the value add because if you had all this, you know, cybersecurity controls in house monitored, um, you only see your, your environment. You don't know what's what's out there, right? And you can yeah. benchmark as well. And and we, we again we, we keep what's called this in it's it's called a QRC quick quick reaction capabilities we have in our SOC to push out things immediately to all of our XDR deployment. So this is a great example, like Log4j, right? So when Log4j come out, you know, we stay in contact with other other 
people across the, the globe, actually, who run stock operations. They, yeah, they may have competing businesses, but we all have the same goal. Right? We all have the same goal of, of helping our clients. And we all know that that we're, we're better together sharing information than we are apart. Right. Um, and so when Long4J happened on that Thursday, literally these guys are pinging back and forth and they're, 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 there are guys out there finding it and throwing out IOCs right away. So we, we would take our, those IOCs, we would, we would search for them and then we would find others and share those back. But we were pushing those out to our customers right away. Boom, boom, boom. And, and they may have been noisy, which is fine, but we're, we knew that this was going to be a big deal. Everybody knew it was a big deal. We had to get detections out there immediately. So like within an hour, we're out there and we were finding, we, we found, you know, some vulnerable stuff. We found one customer that um, we thought that they had an active exploit going on right now. Um, but it comes to find out they have their own in-house security researcher. So he was doing things that were just kind of looked like it was log for j but they were still appreciative. It's like, oh, we didn't, we didn't know. Um, we, we didn't know that he was doing that. And so that's fine. It was good. It, it was all, it was, you know, not an exploit, but we were, we were still on top of that monitoring. And I think that that kind of stuff is important, um, especially when, when things like that happen. And that's not going to be the last one. You know, that, that it's not, it, there's going to be more of those coming down the road. Hey, Greg, like, you know, listening to you, I love, I love the way you describe, I mean, you're just so passionate about this stuff. So, you know, I would love to have somebody like you, like you on my side. Can people call you if like some, you know, shit hits the fan? And yeah. Well, you know, what we don't, what we don't do anymore is, is we don't do instant response for, for people who are, are part of our right, platform, right. just because we've built our platform. We know how to hunt and do things efficiently in our platform. And yeah, I get, I get excited. I love what I do for a living. David, I'm just telling you, I love it. I love, I love, love, love this. Um, but we do have, um, it, we do have contracts and engage with people who will come in from the outside and do a, you know, a, a, an instant response. If you have, if shit hits the fan, like you said, if you have an active incident going on, um, if people want advice, yeah, they can, I, I'm, I try to answer emails as much as I can and that kind of stuff. I, I love to get engaged with, with things. So, um, yeah, I don't mind. I'm, I'm pretty much an open book. So, <laughs> <laughs> and what's the easiest way, Greg, to, to get in touch with you, with the company, to get, um, more information about Blue Shift Cyber um, yeah. and, uh, and maybe start an engagement? Sure. They can go to our website, which is www.blueshiftcyber.com. You want to email me, it's just greg at blueshiftcyber.com. Um, I'm happy to, to answer emails and things like that. But we just got a new website up. I'm pretty excited. I mean, I'm not a, I have no artistic ability. I draw stick figures. So, you know, we, um, we have we have a great we have a great team. Blue Shift has a really great team of guys, both from the sales side who are really engaged. Um, because I can't I can't do that stuff. You know, they they just schedule calls for me. But on the marketing side, we have good people. We just have a really good group of guys um, around us. So um, and we're and we're growing too. We're hiring. So you know, um, you know, check send the emails. I'm I'm always looking to hire good 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 people, um, passionate people um, who want to want to work in cyber. So. That was awesome, Greg. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. Anytime.